Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast. My name is John Harris. we got a special guest on today, Zachary Garris, who just wrote uh, another book. Um, we had, uh, Zach, we had you on uh, about a year ago, I guess I want to say, when you did your book on uh, Robert Louis Dabney. And now you, um, for some reason, just are a glutton for punishment and <laughs> you write controversial books. Uh, they, this one honestly shouldn't be, but, uh, but I can see why in our culture it would be. It's called Masculine Christianity. Now you can tell from the title, that's going to be um, something that's uh, controversial. I've, I've made my way through about 60% of it. And um, I just got to tip my hat to you, um, Zach. You've done a great job, I think, in pulling together so many different things, uh, theology, history, um, some sociology uh, in a way, or at least um, some sociological observations. And I, I mean, I recommend this, to be honest with you, from what I've read, this is you try to actually answer questions people have instead of evading them or um, trying to dance around to give uh, an answer that is halfway politically correct. So you can uh, somehow not get canceled. You just try to give the straight truth. And I appreciate that about you. So um, thanks for joining me. Thanks for being willing to have this discussion. Thanks for having me. So first question. Um, why did you write this? <laughs> Especially with everything going on with the Me Too movement. And I mean, you don't want to be canceled, I'm assuming. So why would you do put this out there? Right. Of course, I'm not looking to be canceled, not looking for controversy. But, you know, as I've, we've all noticed, you know, feminism has been a major problem in society, including the church. I think that's a big thing that I've noticed is, you know, a lot of our churches are feminist. And I didn't think the literature was really meeting the need. And uh, <clears throat> a lot of the complementarian works, you know, there, there's good things in a lot of them, but there's a lot of inconsistencies and deficiencies. And so I set out to, you know, kind of, you know, address the, what does the Bible teach about men and women and, uh, and not really shy away from anything. Well, that is straightforward and simple. And I appreciate that. Um, why don't we start kind of at the beginning, at the root of, um, I, I think maybe perhaps what would be the key to all of this. And that is at the base of it, you seem to be arguing that masculine leadership or uh, you can use a different word if you want headship, I guess, use a biblical word is kind of ingrained in creation. And uh, I know, um, let's kind of reverse engineer this, actually. Let's, let's start with kind of where the debate is within evangelicalism between um, egalitarianism and complementarianism. You kind of go back to this concept of patriarchy that says that there's actually ingrained in creation and God's created design a, um, a place for men, for males, uh, which is they're supposed to be leaders. And that is a very controversial idea today. And so I, I want to give you a few minutes. Why don't you just take us through that? Why would you think, biblically speaking, uh, that men are supposed to hold the places of leadership, um, either in the family, socially, or in the church? Sure. Now, I just want to start by saying that, you know, this is the traditional position within Christianity, and that's what I'm defending. And I do think uh, you know, of course, we have egalitarianism today, which just to define is essentially saying that there are no you know, gender role differences between men and women, or if there are, there, you know, the differences are very minimal. And then, of course, you have complementarianism, <clears throat> which essentially started in the 1980s, and that was a reaction within the church against feminism. And they, they tend to emphasize male headship in the home. And that uh, church leadership, particularly pastors, should be men. So I, I do think they deviated from the traditional Christian position in some ways, and we can discuss that. But when it comes to male leadership, it all starts in Genesis, in the creation account. Uh, Genesis 1 speaks of both men and women being made in God's image, but Genesis 2 gets into some role distinctions that God put Adam in the garden to work and keep it. And as I discuss, uh, 
the word uh, keep can be translated guard. And so he had this protection role, but the, the work he had a provisionary role. And we see that affirmed in Genesis 3 in the fall, where uh, his punishment is tied with working, uh, working the ground. <clears throat> and even his name, uh, which comes from the Hebrew Adama uh, uh, ground. And then Eve, you have Eve, who's a created as a helper for Adam. And we specifically see her role to bear children. And we see that with her name, which is a life giver. And then also in Genesis 3, where her punishment is uh, tied with bearing children. And so you have these role distinctions in the garden. And these are affirmed all throughout scripture. You have, uh, you know, the man as is equal in worth and value with the man, but she has uh, different duties, right? Different functions. And, uh, you know, the Bible even uses this word submit, right? Which is very controversial that wives are supposed to submit to their husbands. So you have that in the marriage relationship. And then you have plenty of scripture texts speaking of uh, male leadership, or you could even say male rule in the church. Um, I get into first Timothy two and three and first Corinthians 14 verses 34 and 35. And so those are important passages, uh, you know, relating to uh, male, male only clergy in the, in the church. And of course, I also uh, get even more controversial and argue that all of these, these gender roles, which are rooted in the natures of man and woman also apply beyond the home and church in the civil sphere. And um, so that, you know, even a woman shouldn't even be a, pres a president or a governor, that those are roles reserved for men. Now, I want to ask you, because uh, I know that um, those listening to this, there's probably a good portion right now. <laughs> I don't know how many, but they're saying, wait a minute, hold on. You know, you're saying a woman can't run for office or something. And um, I, I want to ask a question. Now, maybe this isn't the right question to figure out what God's intentions uh, for design intentions are, but at least um, in the case when there are weak men or men who aren't willing to lead in those capacities, is it a sin for a woman to step up into a role that um, perhaps uh, wasn't part of God's created design, but um, you know, out of necessity to try to keep from chaos from happening, she, she you know, puts her foot forward and decides to at least temporarily take part in something like that. Is, is that okay? Or what, what do you say? Well, without uh, giving a, a straight answer, I think it, it's probably going to depend on the situation. I, I, it certainly deviates from God's design. So I, I don't want to say it's okay for a, a woman to, you know, step into a, a leadership role in the home or church or civil sphere. I don't think that's right. Uh, you know, really, if, if men aren't doing their job, the responsibility falls on them. And it doesn't make it a good thing for a woman to then have to take that role. Uh, but I tend to think that's, that's not usually the, the case we're dealing with. Right. It's, it's usually that the, I mean, we have poor leadership. Men, you know, can be poor leaders all the time. Uh, but especially in our day, we have women seeking to usurp male rule. It's, it's feminism. Right. And you often hear that, though, from uh, the example of Deborah's given and, um, you know, this is kind of or the mission field. You know, what if, uh, you know, you only have one person who really knows the gospel and they need to somehow uh, pass that on. Um, and and I think you're exactly right. I think you nailed something there. Uh, that's if anything, that would be a, um, a deviation. It would not be the, the rule, the general rule. And the question that does not seem to get asked is what should be, what ought to be um, the case? What ought to be the, the design that God has created for females and for males? And how should we carry that out? Uh, rather than what, what are the exceptions? What, where can we somehow bend this or uh, get around this? And, um, and so I, I appreciate you being willing to even just go there because this is a question. It's an honest question. And I would encourage those listening, if you're getting upset, um, you know, you need to contend with uh, the arguments that Zach makes in the book, I think, because 
uh, he, he didn't uh, just come up with these because uh, uh, of some kind of personal bigotry or anything like that. He really is trying to grapple with the text. Um, Zach, I want to ask you, some people will say uh, that um, the design for men and women isn't really a creation design, but it's actually a result of the fall. What do you say to people who tell you, well, the only reason that women are in a quote unquote subservient position in most of human history is because of the fall. And this is something to be overcome by Christians. Yeah, that's the position uh, common to egalitarians. And so they try to argue that the creational ideal is egalitarianism, that Adam and Eve were um, not only equal in uh worth and value, but in, in function. And at <clears throat> Genesis 3, the fall is what introduced male headship or hierarchy. So, you know, a lot of egalitarians will affirm that the Bible teaches male headship and a, a form of hierarchy, but they'll say it's rooted in the fall. And therefore, Christ is overcoming that. He's restoring the natural order, which is egalitarianism. So for one, I think it's, this is important uh, why we establish that male headship and hierarchy are rooted in Genesis 2 and not Genesis 3. And, uh, but I also think, you know, the, the, the New Testament, I think, also gets around this. Uh, so we should appeal to the creation order and, and I give I give some arguments in my book. So so let me first say I have a I have a whole section on page uh, one thirty where I give uh, kind of summarize the I have ten different arguments for for hierarchy at creation. So you, know, you can get into a couple of these like Adam is created first, right? Paul appeals to that in in First Timothy two. And egalitarians they have arguments for all of these, but I, I deal with these a lot in my book. Um, you know, Adam had a protective role over Eve in the garden. Uh, he had a teaching role. He named Eve, you know, things like this. You can also get into uh, Adam representing the human race in the garden, right? So, so federal headship, that was Adam's role, not Eve's. So, so that's creation, uh, creational hierarchy. But when you look at the New Testament, you know, like look at Paul's words uh, in Ephesians 5, he doesn't root male headship in the fall, but actually it's, it's based on Christ and the church, right? So the church is supposed to submit to Christ and the uh, wife is supposed to submit to the husband. Of course, egalitarians have arguments for all of this stuff, but that's, that's what I, I get into in the book. I, I want to ask, and, and you do give, I think, a, a very compelling case, and you try to represent the other side, which is important, uh, but the debate as it stands right now in evangelical circles, at least, um, seems to be, in my opinion, and I'm just putting my, my thought out there, kind of a weak need complementarianism versus a very entrenched principled egalitarianism. Um, egalitarians tend to be very sure of themselves. Uh, they believe that um, equality between men and women in the sense of uh, role, uh, purpose. Um, I mean, depending on how far they take it, um, you know, just about everything uh, is, is supposed to be equal. Um, you know, so, some even would go as far as to say women's and men's sports is wrong. You should have, you know, them together kind of thing. Uh, but they're principled and they have something they're shooting for and arguing for. Complementarians seem to me in my limited experience, but I've read a few books on this and it, it they're very reactionary. They're trying to prevent egalitarians from ripping down orthodoxy. So they're trying to root it in this, some kind of a complementarity um, that does not appeal to the creation norm usually, um, or, or it does not strongly at least link to that. Uh, and they'll, they come up with every kind of exception to the rule and try to kind of argue for what I would consider to be a very um, bare bones kind of patriarchy, if you want to call it that, because you know, women can't be pastors, but they can do every single other thing. They can even shepherd just as long as they're not preaching on a regular Sunday service, you know, that kind of thing. Um, wh why is this the case? Why are we here in evangelicalism? And um, 
you know, is this sustainable? Because that's a question I've had. And how long can we deal with this before we're just taken over by egalitarianism? I don't think complementarianism is uh, stable. And I think it is crumbling. Uh, <clears throat> I should note there's a couple different, well, two different strands essentially within complementarianism. So people today will speak of narrow versus broad complementarianism. There, there was even some tension within the original movement, as I would say John Piper is, you know, holds more of a broader complementarianism, even if inconsistent. He'll, he'll, he'll say things like a woman shouldn't be a police officer or president. And of course, everybody attacks him for it. But, uh, you know, whereas Wayne Grudem, I at least have some quotes in there where he thinks a woman can be president. And so, so there is, you know, a difference here amongst uh, complementarian authors. And that's still the case today. Some of them, I think, are much better than others. Okay. So, but, but I think the fundamental problem with complementarianism was that it, it like you said, it was, a, uh, it was reactionary against egalitarianism. I don't think it's a consistent, you know, fully biblical view, but it's because it was reacting, it, it tried to affirm two things that I think are just obvious in the Bible, which is that, you know, the husband is the head of his wife and uh, pastors should be men, not women. So those are obvious things. So complementarians are trying to affirm scripture. That's good. But they also gave a lot away. And one of those things is they essentially argue these things purely based on like divine command theory. So, you know, the scripture says, wives submit to your husbands, you know, the husband is head of the wife. So they affirm this, but they don't say much as to why, right? Why is it this way? Why, uh, you know, did, did God design things this way? And so one thing I really argue in the book is that gender roles and duties are rooted in nature and creation and God's design. And you even see that with the differences in the, the bodies between a, a man and a woman. I think you can just look at, you know, natural law in a sense um, and see a, a man's body is made, you know, especially for, for physical labor. A woman's body is suited for bearing children. And that, that should be obvious to anyone. And, you know, we ignore this today. And I guess you're, you're a sexist for, for pointing this out, which is just ridiculous. And so... So that's, that's what I try to do is I try to offer a consistent um, uh, vision of uh, biblical manhood and womanhood. That was good. And I, I want to um, take a minute to just acknowledge there are probably uh, women who are listening to this podcast right now who um, I'm sure there are a lot of them are amening you, um, but we are in a state right now where so many men um, don't want to act like men. And I want to let's let's later on get to what it means to be a man if we can but but let's just suffice it to say for right now there's just men who aren't taking their leadership role seriously and women are stuck uh many feel that way at least in marriages in churches um i think in society in general with um kind of being helpless almost like you know they they want to see righteousness prevail they want to see things that need to get done done um and men are not taking that role seriously, which is a real problem. And I think they, to, to, you know, how do, how do we talk to someone like that feels that way and tell them, Hey, look, hold on. Uh, patriarchy is actually a good thing. And it's, and, and, and this is a good thing that God designed. That's it's good for women. It's not, this isn't, uh, something that's meant to hold you back or to um, oppress you or to make you have to live with these weak men who aren't doing anything. This is actually by design a good thing. So if you would just talk to that person and maybe hold up an example of how how this should work, maybe in a relationship, if it was to work properly. Right. So, you know, patriarchy, male rule, it doesn't mean abuse, right? It's often associated with that as if, uh, you know, it's just men abusing women. And that's, that's actually, uh, you know, distortion of, of God's design. So we're, we're speaking here of biblical patriarchy, not, not some, you know, pagan version of it. And so, you know, a husband is to rule his home, but that means, 
you know, God has given him a responsibility and a duty to love his wife, to care for her. You know, first Peter sp speaks of being gentle with her and he's to provide for her. And uh, so that means bring income for the family, put food on the, uh, the, the plate. And so these, these are good things. And, uh, you know, our, our society, I, I don't know, they, they act like uh, patriarchy is just there to, to harm women, but we're seeing the result of a lack of biblical manhood, a biblical patriarchy. And so when men don't do this, that's actually when chaos uh, comes into the picture. And I think we're seeing that in our society today. When men don't uh, fulfill their responsibility, uh, you know, you have women who are left unprotected. And, you know, I look at our culture today where I think the, in the United States, it's like somewhere around 40% of children are, are born outside of marriage. So those are men. They're not uh, committing to women. Uh, they're not honoring women. And, and I think that's the result of feminism. And so, uh, you know, uh, Christian biblical view of manhood and womanhood is going to involve a man caring for his wife, uh, caring for the women around him, uh, leading them well. And the women are going to be satisfied with that. And, uh, you know, I, I think we're seeing a deficiency of uh, male leadership in, in our current society. One of the things that you reference uh, a few times is First Corinthians chapter six, um, and uh, t I'm trying to look for the translation that translates it effeminate. I have it pulled up here in multiple translations here, um, but that the the unrighteous will not inherit to the kingdom of God, and then it expands on that. Um, and homosexuality is part of this, uh, but effeminacy uh, is part of this as well. And I, I you know, it's interesting thinking about this. Um, what does it mean to be an effeminate man? Because I, I'm afraid that we don't have a lot of good role models or definitions anymore. And so um, talk to us about a biblically rooted uh, and created, creation rooted understanding of what a man actually is and what his duties are. Sure. So that passage in 1 Corinthians 6, uh, the Greek word is malakos, and uh, it, it literally is soft. And so Paul is using it as a, a metaphor uh, for homosexuality, uh, particularly the effeminate uh, male person. And uh, that is the opposite of masculinity. Uh, masculinity is not being soft. Uh, but, uh, you know, carrying out God's uh, design for man, which is to uh, exercise authority, godly authority, and take responsibility and lead. And, uh, and so that's, that's how God has designed men. That's what masculinity is supposed to look like. He gives men, you know, a mission in life. It gives us duties to carry out. And when you don't do that, that is considered feminine. You're not acting like a man. And in some cases, uh, it can involve a, a man actually acting like a woman. And so that's where that language comes into play. And you uh, cross-reference that with some contemporary sources uh, that are not, not biblical, but showing kind of where that language is used. And, um, you know, this seems to be the kind of where we are as a culture today is, is many men are effeminate. And I, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking about even um, something as basic as uh, some of these Republican governors who are refusing to uh, fulfill their duty as the governor or legislators uh, who and or justices who don't want to actually fulfill their job because of the social pressure um, upon them uh, because of, of this election and so forth. And and we look around us everywhere we look, it seems like there's examples of men who cave, who aren't going to fulfill their task and take a stand for truth. And, and you said something a moment ago that you think this is the result of feminism. And um, there may be some Christians, I know I'm playing a lot of devil's advocate here, but you, <laughs> it's, it's helpful for people. Uh, trust me on that. There, there's a lot of Christians who are going to hear that and say, well, wasn't feminism, though, something that Christians themselves brought about? It wasn't that our movement and then it kind of got hijacked in the 60s. 
you have a great section on this. W- would you tell us a little bit about first wave feminism and whether or not it was Christian? Yeah, the, the first chapter gets into this. And, you know, I should say that you often hear second wave feminism of the 1960s about there. Uh, you hear that mentioned when people are criticizing feminism and that's tied with the sexual revolution, which that's a, <laughs> that's an important period to discuss. Uh, I think it brought a lot of bad things into our culture. But what, one thing I argue is that feminism didn't start there. That's second wave feminism. Uh, first wave feminism started in the mid to late 1800s. And a lot of people know it, uh, especially they associate it with uh, the right to vote, uh, women's suffrage, uh, the women's movement, as it was called, or women's rights. And yeah, it's, it's not popular to criticize that because, you know, how could you possibly be opposed to women voting? And I, uh, I decided to delve into that a little bit in there, uh, essentially showing that first wave feminism cannot be detached from its later forms, and that you have to go back and look at exactly what the leaders of that movement were saying. Uh, Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, I think is probably the most important to look at. Uh, she's the most radical. And you see these, these women were not Orthodox Christians. They were uh, radicals and heretics, as I refer to them. Um, there were several Quakers that were tied with this, which, uh, you know, the Quakers have some very odd beliefs, and they themselves <laughs> have been egalitarian for a long time. Um, but uh, you have Elizabeth Cady Stan. She has, you know, radical views. She wanted no-fault divorce all the way back uh, in her day. She wanted women, uh, I have a quote in there, she wanted women to, to be able to have access to church uh, councils and, and not just the civil realm. And so she's very clear uh, of what she wants. And uh, there's another author in there, author in there uh, or leader, I should say, I think it was Anna Howard Shaw, uh, who, who spoke of wanting to be a policeman and be in military combat. And so this is all the way back in the 1800s. And so you read this stuff and you realize, uh, wow, this, this first wave feminism was, was quite radical. And uh, so, yeah, and, and I should also mention Elizabeth Cady Stanton's book, uh, The Woman's Bible, where she, <laughs> it's kind of crazy. She, uh, she goes through and, and, you know, criticizes the Bible for all of its patriarchal uh, notions. And so, yeah, she was a radical. Yeah, I've seen that. I've actually, I, I visited um, uh, Seneca Falls, New York, where the 1848 uh, Seneca Falls Declaration was given. And, um, and I've seen that Bible. I've seen, um, you know, the, all the, the National Park Service, what they had set up there. And it kind of hit me that, you know, because I, I had kind of heard that kind of thing, you know, women's rights in the beginning was just a very Christian um, movement. And the more I looked into it, because I read about it afterward, as much as I, I could, and uh it didn't seem like that at all. They're doing seances in the basement of this uh, Wesleyan church. And, um, you know, they're talking about, if you read the declaration, I encourage anyone listening to this, go read the Seneca Falls declaration, because uh, it's not just about the right to vote. There's all sorts of other things. Um, I remember some quotes uh, from some of those contemporary first wave feminists saying marriage is slavery and uh, just, just things that we would associate today with second wave feminism or even third wave feminism uh, had their seed back then. And, um, and I don't know why, well, I could probably put a guess out there, you know, why the history has been so rewritten, but, um, but we're trying to now look back at these women as heroes uh, and the men who forwarded this. And I'm not, I I'm, I'm with you on this. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, I, let, let, let's uh, bring it forward a little bit now. Um, we know that the root of this was to somehow unravel the role uh, that God intended for men. We are now, you know, 100 years, well, we're more than 100, 150 years, 170 years past that. And we can see the effects of this. Uh, we see pornography addiction uh, very high. We see women, um, a lot of single mothers, a lot of... Um, uh, of course, abortion plays into this, uh, uh, domestic abuse, um, all sorts of issues. I mean, I, I know that was predicted by some of the critics back then. Where do you see this going? 
in the next um, 50 years? I, I know that's kind of going out on a limb, but I think we all kind of want to know um, where, where th- does, is there any hope on the horizon uh, in your mind or what do you think? Yeah, it's very concerning. I mean, even our own day, we, we mentioned the um, you know, illegitimacy rate, uh, b- the birth rate in general is dropping drastically. And I just think it's very common amongst uh, younger women, even in the church. And this is something I address some in there, you know, they're, they're trading babies for careers. And I think this is, you know, it's certainly harmful for everyone, uh, men and women. And I, where is it going? I don't know exactly, um, but it's it's not anywhere good. And, you know, we're seeing kind of the outcomes of radical feminism uh, today. It, it just, it never stopped. I think that's that's the big thing. You know, we're seeing a lot of homosexuality. You, you had homosexuality tied with uh, second wave feminism, some, but there was some, there, there were some differences over that. Uh, but now it's kind of, um, you know, become more front and center. Uh, you're seeing transgenderism. So I think that's a, that's a huge thing. And just the kind of the, the madness there where people are almost denying that, you know, there, there's uh, biological differences between men and women, and we should just raise kids gender neutral. So I, I don't know where it's going. Uh, I'm concerned where it's at right now. Right. And uh, and so, you know, I, I think that's partly another reason why I wrote this book is we have to get this stuff straight. Um, I, I mean, we could have some very hard times ahead. Uh, but in another sense, I'm also hopeful because I am seeing um, uh, kind of a, a return to the scriptures, a, a hunger for uh, biblical masculinity, patriarchy. Uh, you know, I don't know what the numbers are, uh, but you know, it should be that people who follow this, who, who look to the scriptures, they're actually marrying and having kids. Whereas a lot of the, the people who, you know, are feminist egalitarians, you know, they're not. So, uh, in the long run, I think we'll be okay, but, uh, in the short term, you know, we could have some problems. One of the things, not not to create too strong of a parallel, but between the Roman Empire and the United States of America and the Western world in general that um, I've heard observed is that in the Roman Empire, you can see this trajectory as the empire fell towards effeminacy in men, uh, where you can even look at the statues, very um, muscular men uh, giving way to at the end of the empire, you can't hardly tell the difference between a statue between a male and a female. Um and, and this was kind of one of the signs that was pointed out uh, that, uh, that th- this spelled the death of the empire uh, when uh, effeminate things, f- feminine things, I should say, um, were, you know, men were interested in that and the women were becoming more masculine in a sense. And, um, and so those lines are being blurred today, even with men who aren't homosexuals, uh, styles, um, habits, uh, art, all these kinds of things seem to be contributing to this. I, I even was thinking about, you know, the, the kinds of films Hollywood produces and what they used to produce in the 1950s and 60s. And there, there clearly is less of a masculine presence. Um, and, and so I, I'm encouraged, though, that you're bold enough to put this out there to just say what I think is pretty obvious. And um, and there is a counterculture uh, movement, which uh, you're part of and I'm part of uh, trying to uh, establish um, healthy, good uh, role models for children and, um, and, and save not just uh, the church, not just um, to fulfill God's commands, which we, we certainly want to do, but also to save uh, the Western world in a, in a sense. I mean, this is the kind of thing that'll do it. It's birth rates. It's, uh, it's men being men. And so, um, so I would encourage anyone who's listening to this, go, go grab this book and it'll at least give you some things to think about. I think it's, it's well put together. Um, is, uh, any final thoughts, uh, Zach, anything that you would want to leave people with? Uh, well, one thing I wanted to mention, you, you know, you hit on, um, kind of government officials not doing their job. And I, I was just thinking that, you know, a big part of masculinity that, that I didn't mention earlier is courage. And, you know, I think that's part of the problem with uh, the abdication of our civil leaders is they're weak, they're soft, they're not manly, they're not courageous. And, you know, so they're not standing up for us. And, and so, 
yeah, we're seeing problems in our government. Uh, we have a, a weak and effeminate, uh, you know, weak and effeminate men leading our, our country. Uh, you know, I just encourage people to, you know, go to scripture. I, I realize my book is controversial because we live in an, a feminist society. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm seeking to affirm the, the word of God and what it teaches. And I think we should do that boldly. We should be courageous in, in that regard. And, uh, you know, we're going to offend people, but, but that's okay. That's, that's not our goal, but that's, that's what's going to happen when we take a, a stand in, in a culture like ours. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I just remind you reminded me of something that I probably should have said earlier. It's, it's almost, it, it's so appropriate that the day we're recording this, I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's talked about online today. Uh, the governor of Virginia removed Robert E. Lee statue from uh, the, I believe it's the U.S. Capitol. Uh, Virginia has statues there and Robert E. Lee was one of them. And so this was, uh, you know, one of the quintessential masculine kind of role models of the United States um, gone. And um, on this same exact day, there's a controversy going on right now in Florida over this Tea Party USA event. They had very scantily clad women go on stage and shoot out all this money. Uh, to a so supposedly socially conservative audience. And I'm not encouraging anyone to look up the video because it'll defile you. But um, this is, it, it's just, it says where we're at, that the conservatives, supposedly, uh, many of them, the political, social conservatives, pro-lifers, um, they're okay with something like that. Uh, but, you know, it's it, hardly anyone will raise a finger to defend, let's say, Robert E. Lee, who was known for his courage uh, his discipline, steadfastness, chivalry, Christian sense of duty, um, et cetera. And so um, your book is needed and we need more people to write these kinds of things and exemplify this kind of attitude. Where can people go to find it if they want to purchase your book? Uh, go to Amazon. Uh, it's available in ebook and paperback. And uh, that, that's the best place to get it. Anywhere else you want to send people? You have a website? Yeah, I have uh, two websites. Uh, one is a Christian education website. Uh, I write on education. It has uh, resources for Christian education. Uh, it's teachdiligently.com. And then I'm more active on my Bible website, and that's uh, knowingscripture.com. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, Zach, I appreciate you joining me for this, and God bless you. I hope your book sells well. My pleasure. Yeah. And God bless you as well, John. <laughs>